All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, this afternoon, we're gonna have a talk from Matt Hansen, who works for Element 84. He and I work together. Uh, Element 84 has an exciting practice area working with geospatial data. And he is a, Matt is a subject matter expert working on, on working on open source software and satellite imagery. Today, he's gonna be talking about how the community is using open source standards to provide consistent ways to access and use geospatial imagery from disparate sources. Um, like the other talks, if anyone has questions, you can post them in the Slack or in the Zoom chat, and I will moderate questions at the end. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for your continued flexibility as we move to this conference from an online conference to a internet conference. So take it away, Matt. Thank you, Gary. So today uh, I will be talking about open standards and open software for geospatial imagery. Uh, but first, and this is actually gonna include uh, a variety of topics, including open data sets, CubeSats, uh, discovery and search of the data, and also cloud optimized data formats. Uh, but first, I wanna talk about what exactly I mean by geospatial imagery. So what I mean here is, I use the term loosely, imagery, is typically thought of as a, a visible picture taken with uh, the optical wavelengths. But here, I really mean any sort of raster data of the Earth that's collected from any type of sensor. These sensors could be uh, active sensors taken with lasers, such as laser altimetry data or radar, uh, or could be passive sensors, such as typical optical sensors uh, or a synthetic aperture radar, uh, oh, sorry, or radiometers or uh, thermal infrared sensors. Uh, and there's a, a few examples to the left and right of a variety of images. So these aren't uh, just strictly red, green, blue. They could be false color imagery uh, or even um, digital elevation maps. Uh, the middle one on the right hand side is an elevation map taken from uh, an altimeter. And so this can be displayed like a picture, even though it's technically really not an image. And so in other words, what I mean is remote sensing. And so I avoided using the term remote sensing because the, you typically have to qualify that if anybody is unfamiliar with what remote sensing is. Uh, and, it, and remote sensing is simply the acquiring information about an object from a distance. Uh, we use the term almost exclusively to mean Earth observation, uh, and it has a wide variety of applications in this day and age, um, touching upon um, uh, not just the sciences, uh, geology and glaciology as it has typically been used, but also now in economics um, and commercial applications, um, international development, disaster response. So why standards? This really sounds boring. So my background is in remote sensing where I've done algorithm development and analytics and machine learning. And over the years, I've worked closely with a lot of scientists that are working with this data. And I always have felt like this has always been more difficult than it should be. 80% of your time is spent prepping the data, getting to the data, uh, figuring out what format it's in, uh, clipping it, reprojecting it, uh, and only 20% or less of the work is actually interesting. And so I've always been interested in creating more tools uh, to automate a lot of these processes, but that in itself is difficult because each data set is so unique. And so the answer really is standards. So I'm gonna, let's talk for a minute about um, the main sources of remote sensing data. NASA, uh, Earth Science Division. Uh, so NASA is not just involved with um, space, uh, but it also has a, runs a lot, a lot, a variety of satellites looking towards the Earth. And traditionally, over the last 40, 50 years, uh, most of Earth Science data really is run by NASA or uh, through NASA in partnership with other agencies such as the USGS. Uh, what you're looking at here is all of the current and planned missions. Uh, you might recognize some of these. Landsat is the most common, uh, the most popular sensor. Um, 
but these encompass a range of the active and passive sensors that I mentioned above. This data is all distributed through uh, what are called DACs that NASA runs. And there's 12 of these throughout the United States. Each one typically has a different focus, such as the PO DAC, the Physical Oceanography DAC, exclusively uh, distributes data having to do with oceanography. Uh, and LP DAC uh, distributes um, inf uh, data about land cover, uh, uh, and, and land products. Uh, the Alaska satellite facility uh, distributes all this SAR data, the synthetic aperture radar data, which is used uh, for a, lo a, lot of, a lot of different applications. Um, perhaps the most popular, it's used with, uh, with sea ice and uh, polar research. So there's a wealth of data here, and um, some years ago, NASA implemented a free and open data policy. Uh, and this is really important because it means that all of this, this wealth of data that, that NASA generates, uh, all of us, the entire world, in fact, has full and open access to this data. Uh, there is no a period of exclusive access to this data. Everybody has access at the same time. Uh, sometimes this is within a day of the data actually being recorded. And there are similar policies for Landsat data, which is run by USGS, and the European Space Agency for their satellites. I mentioned Landsat. So this is the most popular of sensors that most people have heard of. The Landsat program goes back to 1972 and for the most part has operated and generated a complete record of the Earth since then, um, mostly uninterrupted, or at least for a, a large portion of the Earth. Uh, Landsat, frankly, is one of the most important satellites that has contributed to our understanding of Earth science. And the reason why it has contributed so much is because of this free and open data policy. The data policy was implemented in 2008, and since then, we've seen a massive increase in the usage of that data. If you look at the research papers that have been generated over time, ever since the policy was enacted, the research has gone from several hundred a year to a couple thousand a year now. And we see this across all the other NASA satellites as well. Uh, MODIS, Sentinel, uh, we've seen massive increases in the data being used. And it's not just scientists anymore either. It's, um, it's data scientists that are helping policymakers and folks doing disaster response and international development and trying to gain actionable intelligence for their areas of interest. When it comes to Landsat, there was an economic evaluation done that estimated that because of the free and open access of Landsat, it has an estimated nearly three and a half billion dollars in benefits in 2017. So this has had a major impact in our understanding. And the main reason for that is because this data is free and open to everybody. So let's go back for a minute to the list of satellites here. So we have this data, it's free and open, but how can we, how can we use it? NASA distributes all their data through these DACs. There's 5,000 or more different uh, collections of data, but all of the metadata about this is stored within the NASA Common Metadata Repository. So all the, all the different DACs, they have to enter this information within CMR, uh, but each DAC also has their own APIs and tools. There's no real single set of utilities for finding or downloading or using this data. And all the data is also in what we call archival data formats. They're not necessarily cloud-friendly. They're in HDF or NetCDF format. 
So while we have a way to search for the data through CMR, uh, and here's an example, um, here's a diagram of how CMR works. Um, we have um, at its core, CMR is made up of microservices and there are multiple APIs built on top of that. Uh, we have some standards-based APIs, CSW, OpenSearch, and then there's a variety of CMR client applications that are specific to some of the DACs uh, and also legacy applications for backwards compatibility. So this traditional workflow involves searching the DACs through CMR or perhaps one of their, uh, one of their own APIs and downloading those data files and then processing that data on a desktop or maybe even in an HPC, a high performance cluster. So the problem with that approach is that one of the upcoming satellites, as an example, NISAR, is gonna be generating over 80 terabytes per day. In a year, the data from NISAR alone is gonna swamp the entire NASA archive. By 2025, we see an archive of nearly 250 petabytes. The fact of the matter is, is that the traditional way of doing things just can't work. So there's, we have this wealth of this free and open data from these different agencies, and yet finding the data and fetching it and processing it uh, is very difficult to scale due to the massive data volume and also these data set differences. So we really need to change that workflow from the local processing to cloud processing, where the data is stored in cloud-friendly formats in the cloud, and we compute on instances um, or clusters that are close to the data. And we just have a lightweight client that allows us to interact with it. So there is some progress being made here that is the move forward. NASA has a project called Cumulus where they're moving their processing into the cloud so that they all the data will be in, um, in cloud data stores that users can then access with lightweight clients and they can do their analysis next to the data. But as you can imagine, this is a lot of data and can really take a significant amount of time to move it all. So it's an ongoing process. In the meantime, there's, uh, AWS has recognized the value of having cloud optimized data formats and have made copies of some really high value data sets uh, and made them available for free on S3. And this allows users to process the data on instances within the same region AWS, they see the economic value here, of course. Uh, they figure that if they make data sets available for free, that users will use their compute resources to do so. And this is seen to pay off. Uh, Google Cloud and Microsoft have similar programs that are much further behind, but they are trying to do similar things where they're making mirrors of these. So that's all the NASA, NASA and public data which has been very valuable, but there's also commercial remote sensing data. Commercial data is higher resolution typically. Uh, these satellites can be tasked and they can also be very expensive. Um, Maxar, uh, formerly Digital Globe, uh, runs the Worldview satellites. These are a meter or half a meter resolution satellites and you can, you can task them. Uh, they don't collect data for every point on the earth uh, like Landsat and Sentinel do. Uh, but if you, if you pay for it, you can have them point the satellite at a specific location. Uh, but these are massive satellites, just like the ones that uh, the government agencies run. And so the data from it, of course, can be very expensive. Things changed in 2013 with Planet Labs, now just called Planet, launched two small satellites They're called Doves. And this really kicked off an era of CubeSats. So what are CubeSats? CubeSats are small satellites. So we see uh, satellites are classified 
by their mass. So small satellites are anything less than 500 kilograms. And when we're talking about CubeSats, we're really talking about the class from about one to 10 kilograms called nanosats. And a CubeSat is just a strict specification of the size of those that not only allows for the mass production of parts, thereby reducing the cost, but also allowing these CubeSats to be dispensed in a standardized way through orbital deployers. Uh, so with the CubeSat form factor, they can come in a variety of sizes. Each unit is a, a, a small 10 centimeter um, cube is one U and they can go up to 25 U or so. These are, these orbital deployer uh, units are bolted on to a launch vehicle. And then the launch vehicle says when to release, the door opens up and CubeSats, they stream out. So you want a CubeSat? You can get commercial off the shelf um, sensors and you can go to spaceflight.com to get a ride share into space. Uh, I am not, um, uh, this is not an advertisement for either one of these. This is just an example that, that commercial off the shelf CubeSats launching and the actual hardware is a, now a legitimate option. And so for 350K or so, as little as 350K, um, you can launch your own CubeSat with a variety of different types of instruments. CubeSats are quite a bit different than the NASA satellites that we talked about earlier. Traditional satellites are high quality science data. They're very big, they cost billions of dollars, and they last typically a long time with design lives of five years or more. Landsat 5 actually ran for nearly 30 years before it was decommissioned. Whereas CubeSats are meant to be launched and last a fairly short period of time, uh, weeks to months maybe, uh, but maybe up to five years if you're lucky. They're in a low earth orbit. Uh, when the orbit degrades, they burn up in the atmosphere um, and they provide data that's good enough. They don't have the money or the size to be able to put on expensive star trackers or ca uh, expensive calibration uh, instruments to compete with the larger satellites. And so CubeSat companies, which have been um, growing at an incredible rate, really rely on a lot of this free and open data from Landsat and, um, and Sentinel and MODIS to be able to calibrate and compare their data too. And since 2013, we've seen a massive increase in the organizations launching CubeSats. Uh, these typically were the realm of universities that would use small satellites, um, even way back before 2000, um, for, um, for academia and research, uh, but now we're seeing a lot of private companies um, taking advantage of these low cost um, satellites such as Planet. So, so now what? So we have a lot of public and free data, and then we have all this commercial data, and thanks to standards, we have CubeSats. So what do we, what do, we do with this data? How do we search and discover it? How do we perform analytics on it? Well, one approach um, is you can talk to us. And again, this isn't really, I'm not, this isn't intended to be an ad, but we, we have a managed service um, that runs that processing where you launch the CubeSat and we handle the processing of that and the archive and distribution of that data. And again, this isn't an ad, but I wanted to show this because what makes this possible is the fact that we can build it on top of metadata standards rather than having to deal with each data set and each satellite individually. So the reason why CubeSats took off is because of standards. 
We answer here in easy access and use of data for both, for both the NASA and the USGS data or the commercial data. We've got standards for the satellite downlink, the processing, the metadata, the APIs, the data formats. And some of you probably have heard of the Open Geospatial Consortium, which is the organization that develops standards for geospatial data. And there currently um, is a variety of work going on in creating the new generation of OGC API standards. I've listed here the old OGC API, uh, WMS, WFS, uh, and then the new API that will be taking the place of it uh, and what it's for. Uh, most importantly, uh, or what people have mostly heard of is the features API to serve up geospatial vector data that can be overlaid on a map uh, or the tile service to serve maps as tiles. This is ongoing work. The OGC features API has released a version one, but all the others are ongoing. Uh, you can see the website ogcapi.org for more information. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about the APIs. I'd like to talk about some of these technological gaps as they were a couple of years ago. So one, if you have a CubeSat or you're generating your own data and you're generating all this metadata, but it can't be crawled and indexed, then your data might as well not exist. Uh, users um, need to be able to find and easily discover the data. In this day and age, there is so much data, we're drowning in the open data, in commercial data, and that data needs to be easily crawled and indexable by something like a search engine. And as I've pointed out before, if you need to download these files, then you're not gonna be able to scale that processing. Another issue is that if data provenance cannot be determined, then your research, if you're a scientist, cannot be reproduced. And this is a particular um, important point. There's an ongoing crisis in the scientific community, especially in the remote sensing scientific community, um, because papers can typically not be reproduced. Papers will reference data that, that can't always be accessed. They will reference software that isn't open. Um, and just trying to get the data and replicate the algorithms um, is well beyond uh, people's time to just simply be able to reproduce a paper. And so we wanna try and solve these problems. This is an example of um, the, uh, just to illustrate the data provenance problem. This is a typical work directory of, like, of a data scientist who might download one of these data files and then renames it and runs some processing on it and then does that over and over again until you actually don't even really know where the original data came from um, and, and what the final version is. So now I'm gonna talk about how we can solve some of these issues with something called spatiotemporal asset catalogs. This is a new specification to improve the interoperability of geospatial data, both commercial data, as well as these open and free data. So why? I talked about the OGC standards. There is a variety of APIs, but they don't cover this particular problem right here. These are a bunch of geospatial data portals um, from different companies, from NASA. We have Earth Data Search here, uh, L3 Harris Data Finder. We have this Landsat Look program. Astro Digital has theirs. And they all have their own sets of data within these geo portals, and they all work slightly different. So if I want to use data from multiple sources, which really I, I might want to do data fusion, um, I, I'm not going to do analysis strictly just on one specific piece of data. I want to incorporate data from a lot of different places. And so I have to go to each one of these data portals and do something a little different. And while the data might be served up using the OGC API standards, 
the discovery and the metadata fields for which I might search on aren't standardized within any of those OGC APIs. All these companies will typically make the data available through an API as well. We're looking at an open API document uh, as an example. And when you look at these APIs that they make available, the situation is even worse. Each one of these metadata fields is called something different. If I want to search for, um, for earth imagery that has low cloud cover, every data provider might be using a different field to describe the cloud cover. It might be max cloud cover. Uh, it might be cloud underscore cover. One of them might measure it from one to 100% as integers. Others might have it be a floating point from zero to one. So stack was to try and solve this problem. And we're all probably familiar with the comic about um, adding a new standard that's gonna replace all the other standards. And we really want to avoid this. We don't want to just come up with a standard that no one else is going to use. So to avoid this, it's really important to build a community around standards. The way that standards are often generated is a lot of folks in a room, in a closed room, and they'll generate a standard. And then maybe there's a period of public commentary. And then it's released by some standards body and everybody's expected to use it. We wanted to really make sure that there was a community and an option. ACK has been built as a community standard involving a lot of different companies that are interested in this space. Uh, data providers, data users, um, NASA, um, Getting the buy-in from all of these different organizations uh, encourages early adoption and, and, and use of the standard. So what is Stack? Uh, Stack is really, um, it's three different things. It's a metadata model. So it's defined set fields for describing geospatial data. But the focus here is on search and discovery for end users. So it's simple, but we also want to be able to extend it. This is not a replacement for other more complex data or the data providers original metadata. It's really just aimed at the end users. The other thing that stack is I mentioned before that metadata must be crawlable and indexable. And so it's important all these different granules, all these different items of data we might call them scenes, they need to be linked so that you can point to a catalog and then crawl that catalog down to individual items and index them in some sort of database. The third thing that it is, is it's an API. So we can have a static version with all these files that can be indexed, but once we index them into an API, we want to be able to search them in a standardized way. And the way that we do that is we actually work closely with the OGC API features group to make sure that this is a features compatible API. So Stack is in fact an OGC API that serves up um, feature data that describes the boundaries of individual data sets. So in the case of Landsat, for instance, you have a scene, that scene has a, geo, a boundary on the earth and you want to search for all the scenes that intersect with it and that that intersection query and the response back is going to be an OGC API um, compatible API. Uh, so I already mentioned this is not a full-fledged metadata standard. It's not intended to replace internal metadata. Uh, it's not a replacement for for all any of these at all. It's it's a focus on on the search and discovery by end users. So the specification itself uh, is consists of three different entities. We have catalogs, and there's always a root catalog, and catalogs are really containers for other catalogs and 
and collections. Collections are where we group together items. So one data set, um, typically people might call, it, might call it a data set. So Landsat or Sentinel, these might be collections. And uh, it's a set of items. An item is an individual scene or set of files. It can be multiple files for a specific location at a specific date and time. It's a when and a where. It's data for a time and a place. And these are grouped together in collections and collections are grouped together in catalogs. Um, I mentioned before that the linkage and the crawl and being able to crawl these catalogs are important. And so we have every entity has links associated with it. And each item will link to children and parents, items, the root catalog, uh, so that at any point within the catalog, you can crawl it. Uh, we also have other types of links, such as derived from and previous versions. And this is important for the data provenance issue, where you could use a stack item and perhaps process it and take a bunch of scenes. It goes through some sort of machine learning algorithm uh, and, and spits out some sort of classification on the other end. And you can create a new stack item out of that and then have a link that says it's been derived from these source data sets. So that ability to track the data provenance through an entire processing chain is central to stack. Uh, the item itself is, if you're familiar with GeoJSON, uh, stack is at its core at a GeoJSON. Uh, so you have a geometry and a bounding box and, and all the all the fields that are common to uh, a GeoJSON structure. Uh, but then we also have the links. We have properties, which is various metadata about the item. And then the assets is a dictionary that points to the underlying data files themselves. Uh, the properties are um, fields such as the date time uh, or the start and, and end time in the case of a range of data, um, but then we also have um, other fields like the platform, the instruments that were being carried, the constellation, which is the set of um, all the satellites that perhaps work in conjunction with one another. In the case of planet, they have doves and they work, um, they work together. So you might have a hundred satellites, let's say in a constellation. The assets, which points to the underlying data files, um, they have simply a link and, and a media type, uh, but, and then the title and the description, but also uh, this idea of roles, where you can describe something as a data file or perhaps a thumbnail or additional extended metadata, so that um, programmatically you can parse through the item assets in order to get what it is that you need. Stack is extensible. There's a variety of content extensions uh, covering um, SAR data, um, point cloud data, such as from LIDAR. Uh, EO in, includes both optical and, and infrared data. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but um, the, the concept is that um, different types of data sets could be supported by different extensions. For example, the EO extension adds in spectral band information as well as cloud cover. The spectral bands, uh, for anybody who has used uh, spectral remote sensing data, uh, this is particularly useful because of the common name. So what we've done is generated a, a list of common spectral band names so that in the case of, uh, of Landsat and, and MODIS and Sentinel, you, you always had to go and look up what the band numbers were in order to figure out what colors they were. Uh, the data themselves always, we were always presented as band one, band two. Uh, and so what Stack does is it allows you to specify a common name describing the band uh, rather than by number. 
So now contained within the stack record is enough information for programmatically users to be able to access the data and then fetch just the spectral bands that they want. And the assets indicate within the structure which spectral bands are in that. And this is just an example of a stack catalog here. This is a collection that has the extent. We have a variety of properties and we have links. We're gonna, we're going down to the items within that. Now we're looking at some individual items. This is a GeoJSON feature collection. So we have a list of features. It has a geometry, has the bounding box, all the properties. You see it has the spectral band information. And then the assets themselves. And here we have a thumbnail. We can click on the thumbnail and we can take a look at that. I mentioned uh, when I first started talking about a stack, I talked about the importance of it being a community derived um, standard. And part of that effort has been to really drive the development of it with implementations. So developing a standard isn't about just generating, coming up with what you think makes sense. It's, uh, it's coming up with the standard at the same time as creating software to generate it, to use it, um, to create the catalogs themselves, because that sort of development drives the implement, the development of the spec itself. So even though we haven't released a version one of Stack yet, uh, there are validators and Python libraries and APIs, browsers, clients, and a variety of catalogs. Uh, and this is really gonna help um, and has helped encourage adoption of Stack. Uh, here we have a QGIS plugin that was written. So QGIS is a common open source GIS desktop software. It allows you to point to a um, Stack API and then here it is fetching data and viewing it in the browser. Um, this is a, a browser, uh, just a web, a, a browser web app uh, that allows you to connect to any stack API endpoint and search it. You can draw a bounding box, select a date time range and search for data. So if you recall back closer to the beginning, I had all these examples of these geo portals and every single one of them was different. So the concept here is that they don't need to be different anymore. This is a real basic interface, but it illustrates the fact that now anything that has a, any data that's within a stack API is now searchable and queryable with one tool. In a similar fashion, SAT search is a command line tool uh, and a Python library uh, that allows you to do something similar. Here we're searching um, an endpoint for all the scenes that intersect with the state of Maine uh, for the first half of 2019, print a little calendar. We see that there's multiple data sets from Sentinel to Landsat. It's quite a few, so we're gonna search by cloud cover. Um, now we're gonna narrow it down even further by just looking for the Landsat data. And we see here's the data that we have for those dates. We can now take that response, save that as a GeoJSON feature collection, and we can open that up in our favorite uh, GIS software and take a look at those boundaries, uh, or we can use that to download the actual assets if we'd like. So switching gears a little bit to cloud-friendly data formats, this is the other piece. How do we deal with very large data that's impractical to download? Um, in a lot of cases, people aren't necessarily interested in the whole file. So the idea is, hey, let's not actually download the entire file every time. There's several different cloud-friendly data formats that are out there in various stages of development. The most common one for remote sensing is called a cloud-optimized geotiff. 
and I will talk about that one specifically. But there's others as well. There's something called the meta raster format. Um, Czar was developed mostly by the climatology and oceanography community to represent global scale data sets. Uh, the Entwine point tiles is a data format for point clouds. And TileDB is uh, similar, to, um, similar to these others. Uh, it, it handles actually both point clouds and regular gridded raster data fairly well. So they, uh, all these different formats, they, sh they share similar, um, uh, similar features as to the cloud optimized geotiffs. And so this is really three, so three different features here. One is that at the beginning of a file, you have the directory of the file. So this reduces seek time. So the goal here is to be able to access just a single portion of the file. And so by reading in just a small header, you should be able to do that. And so that should be at the beginning of the file. The next thing is to use tiled segments so that each individual piece of this file can be decompressed and loaded individually. And the other thing is to have overviews in the file. Uh, the overviews can be, another way to describe them is reduced resolution um, versions of the data. So that if you want a lower resolution version of the data because you're, you, you're zoomed way out and you're visually looking at a bunch of data sets, you're not reading in the entire data data file, you can just read in this smaller overview. So traditional TIFF images are stored using these striped segments. So here's a little square, I wanna read that square. Uh, if I have striped segments, I have to read in both those, both those stripes. So the tiled segments allows us to read in just that one tile. If I wanna read in a bigger box, in this case, I only need to read in those nine internal tiles. And on the right-hand side, we see this is, an, this is an overview. So this is a reduced resolution overview. And I read in those, those four larger tiles, but that's a lot less data. So with these cloud optimized formats and stack, we now have a formula that allows us to query data and individually just get pieces that we need and stream the data efficiently to end users. Um, this is an example of st uh, Stack Browser. Stack Browser is a little web app that allows you to browse a stack catalog. And so here, this is a bunch of uh, disaster data from Planet um, after Hurricane Harvey. And so here we go to the Stack Browser and we're actually looking at the actual cloud optimized geotiff right here. This allows us to look at the preview and zoom in because it's in uh, this cloud optimized format. Uh, another example here is uh, here we're looking at Ngoro Goro Crater, which is in northern Tanzania. That's the red circle. And the purple square is a footprint of a sentinel scene. And the green uh, square is the footprint of a Landsat scene. So we don't want or need all of that data. We don't need to download all of that. We only want what's in the circle. So with that SAT search application, we can search a catalog. We find 18 different uh, data scenes uh, with low cloud cover. And then we can use something called SAT fetch to download just that small area of the file. So here uh, I've gone and downloaded all 18 files. Um, the red, green, and blue bands, I just had to specify the bands to make RGB files of each one of these. And it took uh, just under a minute to do this. Each one of these Landsat scenes, if you go and download that directly from USGS, each scene is one gigabyte. So you would have had to download 18 gigabytes of data um, because you're not only downloading the entire file, but you're also downloading a whole lot of spectral bands that you don't need. And here we do the same thing with Sentinel data. So the point of showing this here is that we're using now one tool to access multiple data sets in the same exact way because 
we have the data available in a common metadata format uh, and the, the data itself is in a cloud optimized format. Um, this is loading. I guess I'll skip that. Uh, so this, uh, so having this data available in this way really enables some very interesting things. There's a community of folks called Pangeo, which are working on um, supporting open source software tools to be able to efficiently use data for science. And so if we have in these storage nodes off to the left, you see these are, a, these, these are data sets in some cloud optimized format that we can efficiently query and find just the data that we need. And now we can have uh, Jupyter running in on like Jupyter Hub or like uh, Binder, and we can interact with that data all completely in the cloud. We can open up the data as X arrays and we can do processing in a deferred way using Dask. Um, and I have a little example here of the national water, uh, this national water model where it's computing and visualizing the average river discharge from um, I think just under 2 million rivers in the United States. Uh, so this is a little notebook. Um, don't need to, I'll just, I can just let this run. Uh, Actually, I'll, I only have a couple slides left. Uh, so being able to do that is possible because we have this open data in these cloud-friendly formats. We're using open software. It's based on open standards. We have scientists doing open science. And that's it. Thank you. I'm gonna actually gonna back up uh, so you can watch the notebook here while Barry ask some questions. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> so if someone was interested in getting started and doing some sort of experiment with satellite imagery, is there a, a starting point you would recommend somebody who's outside of the space to look at? Um, yeah, I, I think that sat, the sat search um, tool, if you're, if you're a developer that's familiar with Python, um, and want to use uh, some, a Python library or a command line tool, that's a, pr a pretty good way to start. Um, but if you just want to like, if you just want to look around and, and look at some data, the Earth Data Search um, application for, by NASA um, allows you to search the entire archive and, and look, at, um, look at NASA data there. You mentioned earlier, you had a slide earlier where you showed uh, a bunch of different uh, renamed files on the, the machine of a hypothetical data scientist. And I was wondering if you felt like the community of data scientists that you've worked with would benefit from software engineering practices like using Git in some way or something like that that isn't being used. Yeah, I mean, I, so a lot of this really is culture and an older way of doing things. Um, scientists, so the Pangeo community really represents a community of scientists who are uh, exploring and developing newer ways to do things and trying to evangelize those to an, the older crowd of scientists. Uh, so, I mean, I think they could definitely benefit from, uh, from, from newer things and, and Git, of course, is great. I think that that's a great first step is, is just using, just using Git for source control. Um, but that doesn't really help you with the data because you can't, this is, this is these are large data sets, right? So sure. you can't really use that in source control, but, um, but yes, they could definitely benefit from that. So, so quick, this question is from Eric. Uh, what happens to the CubeSats after they're at their end of life? Yeah, so CubeSats generally they burn up. Um, so they're in, so CubeSats are launched into a fairly low Earth orbit because, well, for the main reason is that you can think of it if you're the further away you are, 
the more expensive optics that you need in order to zoom in, right? So if you want a high resolution satellite, the closer you are to the earth, the better, uh, because you don't have equipment. So these things tend to be fairly low and close to the earth. And so they, when they, they, their orbit degrades over time. And so this is the main reason why they don't last as long. They degrade over time and then they actually will just burn up in the atmosphere. So CubeSats aren't a big source of space junk. We do have a problem with space junk and generally doesn't come from CubeSats. Interesting. Do you know if there are scientific communities outside of the geospatial community that are using Pangeo? Yeah, so there is actually, there's, um, there is a group um, of neuroscientists that are using the same approach that Pangeo is using for visualizing um, uh, large um, data of the human brain. So it's the same type of, you know, they have, they're in neuroscience, they're in having the same issues with really massive data. I mean, even like, even slices of really small an, brains from small animals are, uh, can even dwarf a lot of the remote sensing data that we see. Mm -hmm. And they're in three dimensions. Interesting. Can you talk about what the use cases or types of businesses are that are driving the increase in CubeSat deployments? Yeah, so I, to be honest, I think that's an open question. Um, I'm not sure that anybody has quite figured out what that business model is. It's not just CubeSats, um, but it's also, there's companies that have arisen doing data analytics on data from CubeSats. So like Orbital Insight, um, and Descartes Labs. These are, are companies that are, are, are planning on, um, uh, that have a business model centered around doing these large scale analytics. Um, I know that one of the big customers, of course, for a lot of these commercial satellites is the, is the US government. Um, and, but for commercial applications, uh, I, think that's, I think that's something that still a lot of people are really kind of figuring out. There's definitely applications in like disaster response is a great one. Post disaster, um, you really need actionable intelligence. Um, SAR data um, sensors are really great for that because they can cut through uh, clouds, which are really common, let's say after like a flood or like smoke after a fire. Um, but it's not clear like how, if that's a viable business model either. Sure, interesting. Have you seen any interesting applications of machine learning in the uh, on top of satellite imagery? Um, yeah, so I think that so the some of the main applications really are right now are are automated mapping. Um, of course, there's large portions of the Earth that are not mapped very well, uh, and these can change rapidly. Uh, Facebook has done a lot of great stuff using machine learning at, at, at doing really large scale uh, automated mapping. Uh, it's a really difficult problem. Um, for one, uh, I mean, you can think of, you could look at an image, right, and, and perhaps map out roads and buildings, uh, but then the question is, it's, it's all the details like, um, like overpasses, right, and like how do you how do you map that? How do you know that one road is going over another? And that's really hard to do. Sure, you just have a two dimensional image. Interesting. Cool. I think that's all the the questions we've got. So uh, thanks, Matt, for taking the time to come and present on this subject for us. Um, and if anyone's interested in following up later, Matt has joined the the Slack, so uh, you can feel free to uh, interact that way. All right, great. Thank you, Gary. Thanks. Thanks, everyone for for joining.